Here we go. All right. Okay, so now we are recording. So be careful what you say. All right. Um, so what I want to do is I want to uh, kind of do a, little, a quick little presentation on um, a little PowerPoint that I've prepared for you on our favorite thing, epidemics and pandemics. And then at the end, I want to open it up to everybody and I want to hear, you know, try and have a discussion as best we can in this particular format. So during my presentation, if there's questions you have, write down your questions so that at the end you don't forget them and that and we can we can kind of uh, we can kind of use that that format to, to talk about some of the things that I'm bringing up. So without further ado, um, what I want to do is uh, share my screen and we'll we'll get this uh, road on the show or show on the road. Okay, there we go. So, epidemics and pandemics. Okay, so um, this kind of I prom this prom I prompted to start doing this thing after the Beatles Open Space uh, conference they had a while back, and this kind of clicked into my my brain is uh, epidemics and pandemics and. This, this isn't the first one we've been dealing with, but the main thing I want to know is how is it going to affect our residential outdoor programs. I mean, that's what that's kind of what we're all kind of focused on. There might be other people that are working in other aspects of this, but AEOE traditionally caters to residential outdoor schools. And this is kind of what I'm curious about. What, what's this, what does this mean for us? Well, we already know some of the stuff, right? So before we get going, I want to just share this, um, this quote that I found from uh, Frank Snowden. And one of the things in here is he talks about is we have to realize that we're all in this together. And yes, I can agree with that. And we have to think of we're all one species and rather than about divisions of race, ethnicity, economic status. But part of me thinks that when we engage in this, when we have these epidemics and pandemics, it tends to magnify or shine a light on the disparities in ethnicity, economic status, and the rest of it. And um, maybe that's something we need to kind of take into consideration when we're, when we're figuring out how to move beyond this sort of thing. So um, we're at Outdoor Schools. This is where I work at Camp Keefe on the Central Coast of California. And uh, our campus, like many other campuses right now, are, is empty. There's no kids running around. There's nobody at the campfire circle singing or, or telling stories. And most of the employees have been laid off. And it's quiet, and this is this is unnerving. It's 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 unpleasant, and it breeds you know speculation. What's what's in store for the future of residential outdoor education? What do we how how do we how do we deal with this? Well, before we uh, do this, what I want to do is I want to hop back into the wayback machine, and I might be dating myself by using this thing. And I'll be. Some people are wondering who this is. Of course, this is um, you know his boy Sherman and Mr. Uh, Mr. Peabody, but we're gonna go back to the Wayback Machine and go into the 1300s and to go all the way back to uh, begin our brief history of epidemics. It's kind of a trip down memory lane. So we're gonna start off with this little guy right here. This is Yersinus pestis. It's a bacteria that was responsible for the bubonic plague. And many of you uh, might know how the plague all played out, but basically uh, that was a bacteria that infected the rodents, the rats. They were immune to this bacteria. But when the fleas would bite them, the bacteria would get into the flea, clog their digestive systems. Uh, and then when they would bite the human host, they would barf that bacteria back into the human host. And it caused nasty things within the human host. Um, it caused death of the extremities. Uh, it would go into the lungs and uh, create a secondary infection called pneumonic plague, which was highly contagious and created uh, widespread death all, you know, all over, all over Europe. And from 541 to 1665, I mean, there were numerous plagues, usually would happen once or twice every generation, 40 outbreaks in 300 years. It would go through and, and kill like 20% of the men, women, and children were uh, eliminated by the plague. Uh, in 1347, it got dubbed the name the Black Death. And as I mentioned earlier, one of the reasons why, it, not only because it was a horrible thing, but because it caused death in the extremities and uh, they would turn black. So 
a number of things happened as a result of this, okay? People started realizing that the disease wasn't spread by evil spirits. It was actually human to human contact. In London, if you had a uh, family member with a disease, you would, have to, um, you would have to carry a white pole with you when walking around in public. Uh, one of the ways in which we deal with contagious disease now started during the plague outbreaks in the 1300s in the Venetian uh, uh, city of Ragusa, where they decided to keep newly arrived sailors uh, in isolation for 30 days, and they called that a Trentino. And then they increased it to 40 days, which they ended up calling a Quarantino. And so that's where our modern day quarantines started back during the plague. And please don't confuse this with Quentin Tarantino or Trenton. Quarantino as well. So um, our next stop is smallpox, and smallpox was not a virus. It was a, it was a I mean it was a virus, not a bacteria, and it was responsible for uh, uh, quite quite a quite a bit of disfigurement and death. Uh, smallpox created these uh, pus pus filled blisters on on the body. It was highly contagious, uh, shared by you know, spread by saliva, skin to skin contact, airborne had a 30% mortality rate. So pretty nasty thing. And uh, the thing is, is that it was around for quite a while. And uh, the, most of the people in Asia and Europe and Arabia had developed some sort of immunity to it. But when the biggest epidemic, smallpox epidemic, was the one that happened in the Americas. When the Europeans arrived to in, in the Americas, the Native Americans had absolutely no immunity to smallpox and some of these other diseases. And estimates are that approximately 90%, 90 to 95% of the indigenous population was wiped out by smallpox and other diseases. In Mexico, millions were killed, not by Cortez and his soldiers, but killed by the um, by, by diseases. In fact, some scientists think that so many people died in the Americas that it might have been responsible for our climate change in the sense that all these Native Americans that were cultivating this land were eradicated, uh, then the land was fallow, increased plant growth, took carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, possibly responsible for the, the Little Ice Age. Well, smallpox was actually one of the uh, diseases that early diseases that they ended up creating a vaccine. There was a doctor by the name of Edward Jenner who noticed that uh, milkmaids who contracted cowpox, which was a much milder form of the disease, didn't get smallpox. So what he did is he took some cowpox and he grabbed his uh, gardener's nine-year-old son and inoculated him with the cowpox and then later exposed him to smallpox and lo and behold, um, he did not get sick from the smallpox. And so the, that's how they ended up getting this vaccine for smallpox. And smallpox is actually eradicated in the wild. Officially, it, it's no longer out there. Um, they say there's captive strains in the United States and in Russia in, in the freezer. Okay. So um, next we go to, aren't we, we're hitting all the hits right now, okay. Uh, next is cholera, another bacterial disease. Cholera uh, affected the lower intestines and was a nasty way to go. Uh, it caused violent diarrhea. People basically shit themselves to death. I mean, they dehydrated from, from cholera. Cholera was really the first pandemics that started. And a pandemic is something that happens globally. Epi epidemic is more locally. And the reason we start getting pandemics in, in the 1800s is because people started traveling more. And in particular, there was the British Navy and the British Empire. Those guys uh, touched all points of the globe. And so the British Navy ended up spreading this thing over the next 150 years. There were numerous uh, seven cholera pandemics. And this was also kind of the beginning of epidemiology. People started studying how diseases were spread and where, where they might be uh, contracting them and how they would be contracting them. There's a, a doctor in, uh, in London by the name of John Snow. And this guy actually was able to, I know, I know what you're thinking. No, it's not that John Snow, okay? It's, it's, it's this John Snow right here. And he was able to figure out 
how cholera was being spread because they used to think it was miasma by evil, you know, by air. It was spread from, you know, bad humors in the air. But he ended up taking cholera deaths over a 10-day period and plotting them on a map. And he noticed that they were all centralized around one particular area. And when they started looking in that one particular area, they noticed that there was a water pump there. And that water pump was responsible. They took the handle off the water pump, made it unusable, and the cholera deaths uh, dried up. And so this was kind of the beginning of a, a global effort to improve urban sanitation, protect drinking water from contamination. And there is a vaccine for cholera now. It's largely vanilla eradicated, but there are, it, there are outbreaks occasionally, and it's usually associated with uh, you know, poor sewage and no, no access to clean drinking water. Uh, next, we have influenza. All right, and now uh, we're going to talk about a number of, uh, there were a number of outbreaks, but the Spanish flu of 1918 was probably the biggest. Now, they call it the Spanish flu, but really, not really. It was, uh, it was uh, started in Kansas at an army base, uh, uh, Fort Funston in Kansas. And the army soldiers there ended up going to Europe and spreading it to Europe. And it got uh, in once it infected the soldiers in uh, England and France, they did not want that to get out. Once the epidemic reached Spain, which is a neutral country, word came out that there was this flu epidemic, and so it got named the Spanish flu. It should have been the Kansas flu, but you know, history is that way. So this is a picture of uh, in, in the army base in Kansas where they had this flu outbreak, and all these soldiers eventually you know, go, went to uh, you know, even when they were infected, they went off to, to war in Europe. And notice that a, there's a few people with masks, but not that many. This was kind of the beginning of germ theory. People started figuring out how things were spread. They took the mucus, and filtered the mucus out, and they were able to get the bacteria out of there because they had this pneumonia, but then they noticed there was something else in there, and it was this virus that was, that was figured out there was airborne. So then they decided, okay, well, we better start making corrections on how we're dealing with people. So more masks, separating people, so airborne, it wouldn't be spread quite so easily. And the way this, this, uh, this epidemic played out was in three waves. We had the initial uh, infection here, and then um, it ended up, going to Europe and the, the GIs came home and then had this tremendous infection in the second peak right here. And that's when they figured out, okay, it's airborne. We need to, we need to make accommodations for this. So they in instituted social distancing, had to wear masks. They closed down restaurants. They closed down um, uh, uh, other, other uh, theaters and public places in, and uh, people got pissed off about this. They got very upset. And so people started, getting mad and protesting and there were anti-mask leagues and then the, the infections went down. So they said, okay, we'll relax these, these mask guidelines and lo and behold, ended up with another peak right there. So in looking at this, you kind of you wonder, how does this play out for us today? And so right now, I mean, we just passed over 100,000 people have died from COVID-19. And uh, most of the ensemble models, these are models that they, they take all the models, kind of put them all together and create these little averages. And most of them think that, yeah, well, there is going to peak probably in June and then it's gonna start dropping, but how is it gonna work? Is there gonna be complete eradication? Is there gonna be a slow eradication? Maybe there's gonna be persistence over time and it'll just kind of be there for a while. And then there's also this idea of the, uh, my personal opinion is I think it's going to be a combination of the two bottom graphs right here where there's going to be a persistence and then there's going to be outbreaks reoccurring and that's kind of what we're seeing right now. So how does that apply to us? Well, this is the environment that we uh, work in. We have this model that we have uh, created in residential outdoor education where we bring students from one geographical location to another, from a variety of localities, cultures, communities, all represented. And they, we put them in this one little spot where they interact and they live and they sleep and they learn and they play together in a group living situation for several days. This is a virus's dream and it's an epidemiologist's nightmare. All right, 
And uh, so what does that mean for us? Well, the CDC has come up with guidelines and this is, these are guidelines that they created for schools and youth, youth programs. And they kind of divided it up into a couple different, uh, three different scenarios, no community spread, minimal to moderate community spread or substantial community spread. Well, they've just come out with, just last week, they came out with programs for youth camps and, um, and, uh, and if you look at this, it's kind of similar. How should you consider opening? If you can meet these requirements, then yes. If not, you move to the next, next phase. Are your recommended health and safety actions in place? If yes, you can move to the next phase. If not, you're not opening. And so, um, so far, this is what the CDC came out with. A better thing is the American Camp Association has come out with an 82 page document. And there's a link to it that, um, we could probably provide for you um, once we get back into the, the Zoom feature. It's also, it's, um, it's in the document I included in the Google Drive for this, for this uh, conference. There's a link on it as well. Or just go to American Camp Association and look for the field guide for, for uh, how, to, how to deal with this, the CDC guidance. It's very detailed. So what's the bottom line? The bottom line. Are parents or administrators going to feel comfortable having kids attend a residential outdoor education program? Um, well, yeah, they will, as long as there's no community spread from both communities, both where the kids are coming from and where they're ending up. If there's minimal or moderate community spread or substantial community spread from any of the communities involved, it's not happening. I, I just, I don't see it as a possibility. So how do we get to this? Well, we need vaccine or herd immunity or treatment. And the most, the most, the best estimates as to when that's gonna actually happen is probably maybe early 2021. And then if you extend that out from there, you know, what's, when are we gonna actually be, be able to open and schedule groups to come? So are we doomed um, or is, is there hope, okay? Well, you know, I like to look at it this way, all right? In the past, pandemics has forced us to look at things differently, okay? It's kind of a portal. After each pandemic that we've had, now incidentally, and really, Roy, this pandemic is a portal. You can write that one down. That's a really great essay to, to read, and, and, and I highly recommend that one. At any rate, in the past, what has happened is with small, the plague, the smallpox, cholera, as we've learned, We've made adjustments, quarantine, social distancing, face masks, vaccines, improved sanitation, I mean, you know, public service, drinking supply. It's, things have changed. Every time this has happened, the flu, we ended up getting better health service. Socialized medicine started appearing after the 1918, 1919 flu. World Health Organization was developed after the, the global pandemic because they realized it goes throughout the world. So after each one of these pandemics, there's changes that are made, okay? So what, what are the silver linings? I'm always one to look for the silver linings. What, how, can we, how can we springboard off this, you know? For one, I'm gonna tell you, teachers are way more appreciated now. I mean, parents are, are definitely really realizing that teachers are very valuable. Oh, incidentally, just a side note, this photo is totally not staged. Right. I mean, look at the board behind it. I mean, that make that makes total sense of all those things. Anyway, I just thought I'd point that out. I found that amusing. Um, also, another silver lining is I think attitudes at workplace are going to be different. People are going to be like, oh, tough it out. You know, come to work. I'll, okay, yeah, I don't feel well, but I'll work anyway. No, people are going to be like, no, don't your your work. Don't come in. You know, and that's I think that's going to be changing as well. One thing I've noticed: people are outside. People are walking more, families are walking more, and they can't go to stores, they can't go to malls, they're not going to theaters, so where do they turn to? They turn to nature, and they turn to walking in nature. And I have seen so many more people, maybe you've seen that as well, walking with families in nature. And in my mind, that's not a bad thing. Um, people are turning to gardening, more gardening supply stores are selling out with a lot of stuff, so more people are out there gardening. And then air quality. Look what's happened with our air quality. Things are changing, okay? Uh, it, down in, in California as well. I mean, this is a picture of India, both pre-coronavirus, during the coronavirus. LA, same sort of thing. So there are silver linings out there. So 
this is our goal. This is what we want to get back to. We want to be able to get back to having kids and taking kids outside. And we want to be back opening for our residential outdoor programs. So how do we do that? What do we do? You know, this leaves us with a lot of questions and hopefully you have some questions as well, or maybe some comments and maybe answers to these things. How do we stay viable? How do we stay involved in the minds and the communities of our stakeholders? How do we ensure a client base for our future operation? I mean, I'm going to tell you this, one thing that, you know, once we do open up, who's going to be able to afford to come here? Are we going to be able to make sure these opportunities are going to be available to all the students? Because it's going to be the wealthy ones that are going to be able to, you know, yeah, sure, we can pay for it to come down. They're cutting education right now. So how do we make sure everybody is, is able to come to these residential outdoor programs? And finally, how do we maintain our sanity? You know, not to get depressed. I mean, 2021 is a long ways away. What are, what are the options we naturalists have? What can we do? How do we stay involved? And so... I'm just going to end it right here, and I want to go back. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and uh, I want to kind of turn it over to all of you. And uh, I haven't seen what the, some of the chat is. I've been kind of out of the loop on this. Uh, okay, yeah, Mr. Sherman, good. Okay, somebody the same generation as I am, and I'm glad. Some if somebody has the link to the um, to the American Camp Association guidelines they can put that up there as well maybe andrew probably has that and a few people can link on that it's a real it's a really great it's a great um great great uh guide okay so i'm not sure how you want to do this but uh, basically my questions were you know how do we ensure a client base for future operations how do we stay viable how do we make sure environmental opportunities will be available to all students and how do we maintain our uh, our sanity, not get depressed, okay? So, um, Tom mentions going to have to have separate students sleeping in quarters and individual tents. That's, some people were saying, you know, maybe you're only going to allow uh, schools come from one geographical location. You're only gonna allow them to come from that one geographical, you can't mix schools from different places. And then that makes me think, well, what's our, you know, money-wise, how is, is that an economical thing to do? I don't know. I've been talking a lot. Is there anybody else out there that you wants to, you know, chime in on any of this? Paul, I see Paul's hand up, or if you just want to jump in there, but I see, I see Paul, go ahead and go, go ahead and go, Paul. Cool. Yeah. I just wanted to share a few things that we're looking at. One is, yeah, reducing numbers and cutting expenses because we'll have fewer staff and serving just one school. And then I've been in communication with the superintendents a lot. And something I'm hearing about is this idea of like pods within the class. So only half the class is attending at any given time. So we're even looking at which just serving two classes at a time, keeping them separated under camp. And then within each class, keeping that the two pods or cohorts separate. And that's one thing we're, we're working on models to have residential programming that way, uh, going down to five kids in a cabin so that we could get eight feet between each kid. And then, and that's only if, you know, the health department says that we could do this. Another model we're looking at to just stay viable, we serve the Bay Area, but we're up here in Sonoma County and Occidental, but we're talking to the local superintendents and principals for our local schools. And for those kids that if they go to a model where they're only going to school two days a week, or if they're only going to school from eight to 12, how could we serve the local schools to provide childcare for these, these families and do some outdoor ed and even some tutoring to help them with their homework? We're just kind of hustling and looking at every option. We're also looking at an option where we go down to schools and offer units, science units, social emotional units uh, in the classrooms. That's just my two cents. Thank you everyone, good to see you. That's good. Yeah, that, for, so that was one of the things I was thinking is actually going, instead of them coming to us, we come to them. And like, I like that for providing childcare. You have to have um, individuals that are willing to do that and willing to travel, you know, with the, the possible risk that, that that might be. I noticed Karina has her hand up. I'm just looking at, I'm randomly going through. Go ahead and go, Karina. Yeah, thanks so much, Dean. Um, we're you know, like Paul, just trying to think about reinventing ourselves and reinventing what we do. Um, we're considering 
day trips when they're allowable, of course, and uh, with many fewer students all from the same school or the same district. Um, you know, school busing is a real issue, right? Socially distanced school busing. We're, uh, our leadership for our county office of ed is saying probably no more than 15 kids on a bus when you used to get 60 right so that really um, scales down but one thing i wanted to mention um, is for our offer to bring naturalists to the class or to do our virtual content which is what we're really trying to sell for the fall because we're not even sure if kids are going to be in classrooms in our county that we serve um for the equity piece is that we've gone to a pricing where it's price per class not price per student to hopefully capture um the idea of all students being involved so um that is, was just a thought that i wanted to share with folks obviously we're gonna be losing money. It's not the revenue we would have had before. Yeah, okay. I see. I see the money aspect is going to be is going to be kind of an issue. I think. Um, anybody else out there have, have things that they want to uh, contribute? I know. Um, one one aspect I, I had heard is that Santa Cruz. Some of the Santa Cruz schools are allowed to have. I'll get to you in a minute, Weasel. I see your hand up. Um, some of the Santa Cruz schools are allowed to run their camps, mm -hmm. but the county health officer has told them that they may only cater to people in their own county. And so they can't have any out of county students come in, which kind of that really, uh, you know, uh, limits their, their, uh, their client base. Uh, Weasel, you wanted to chime in? Yeah. Um, at Walden West, we also work with our county office of education. Um, under them. So we're still waiting on a go ahead from them. Um, but we had, we've tried to come up with a bunch of different proposals. Um, you know, summer camp, we had a, an idea of all the groups, like there's only a certain number of groups. And then within that, they bring their own food and we have lunch out on trail and everyone has a different spot and basically we never come together as a full camp um other ideas were just um for the fall like day camps um like paul mentioned working with schools where if, if they do go in that direction of only half the kids going to class seeing if we can work out a way to get the other half that's not at school to come up at camp instead um but then yeah there's the school bus issue and all kinds of things and we're lucky to be close enough that we could realistically ask parents to just drive and drop off their kids you know we're only 10 15 minutes out of saratoga it, you know we serve the bay area it's a pretty connected area um and then to stay relevant we've just been hammering out so much social media and teaching supplies online and um, but all that is free right now. So like Karina said, like, we're definitely not making any money, um, which means probably not going to have a big old staff in the fall if we do it all. So, but yeah. just, just some things that we've put forward and. And what count, what county are you in? Uh, Santa Clara. Okay. Um, I know so in some of the chat on the side, Jasmine uh, put up something from um, Jasmine. Did you want to talk more about the curricula that you were? Sure. Um, so, you know, I personally identify as both an environmental educator, but also a disease ecologist. And that's looking at um, diseases moving through wild animal populations. Um, and there's a lot that a lot of people know about white nose syndrome, um, other diseases affecting wildlife in our own backyard, um, from West Nile virus to um, chytrid fungus to a bunch of other diseases that are impacting um, wild populations and having significant impacts on mortality and morbidity. Um, so if you wanna bring in kind of the element of pandemics and human health and climate change um, and wildlife health, 
check out the, the concept of One Health. Um, it's well known throughout medical and veterinary circles. Um, and it's really saying that everything's interconnected. So it goes back to our themes that we already use. Um, but when air quality improves, streams improve, the health of the um, you know, creek organisms improve. So really getting back to everything we already teach, but it gives you maybe a theme or, or just a framework to kind of center it on. Um, but there's, if you Google search One Health, there's a great Venn diagram that kind of shows some of the intersections. And then also different career options of where people are kind of focusing their attention. So if you're also working with teens or um, community college, it's a great opportunity to, um, you know, have them explore different career options and give them some hope um, going forward if they're interested in either ecosystem health or human health. That's good, thank you. Um, I, can I springboard off that and then let's haul you up there, Angie. Um, Sasha had mentioned earlier, she's, you know, there's layoffs. A lot of us have been laid off. And uh, how do we stay involved in outdoor education in this context? And do we just wait it out or how many schools? She's kind of curious, how, how many of you, a lot of you have been laid off or had people laid off in, in your, at your campuses? A lot, a lot of, see a lot of hands up, yeah. So any ideas on how, you know, what, what are the options for outdoor educators? If they can't work at a camp, what do, what do they do, you know? Anybody? I'll let you, I'll let you, I'll let you cogitate on that one. And then Angie wanted to say something. Go ahead, Angie. Yeah, so um, we've been, in terms of like staying viable and how do we bring in money, even if it's not at the number we hoped it would be for this year. Um, we're in Plumas County. We've been fairly unaffected by the virus, but we serve um, primarily Sacramento and Reno, which are considered hot spots in our minds. So we've shifted our thinking um, to how could we serve the local community because we're going to have to do it potentially at a lower price point. We're a little bit more remote and we may be doing things with less staffing. So this may be a time where we can gain relevance with our local community in a safer way than inviting people um, from these higher risk areas where COVID is still moving between people. Um, and then one thought on your question, Dean, I have seen um, via Instagram, like a few people who are deemed like influencers reaching out and doing Zoom meetings or Zoom lessons for teachers or for schools. And I know that's unpaid and um, that's challenging to do if you've been furloughed. But if there's ways to connect with your local school and offer yourself or your knowledge as a resource, Maybe it'll fill up your heart. I know it may not fill up your pocketbook at this time, um, but I'm also trying to figure out what I do because I'm working part-time compared to full-time right now of how I can still be a resource to others. Good, thank you. Um, I, I'm seeing hands up. I, I, there's these little blue hands. I like how you can do that and that way you don't have to have your hand up the whole time. But I uh, told Lori and then I'm gonna go to Karina after that and then Joanna. All right, so um, Lori, you want to chime in? Uh, no, I just put my hand up as one of the folks uh, laid off. And, oh, okay. uh, but thank you for the opportunity. Okay. And oh yeah, here's here's just uh, something real quick. Is uh, the concern that I had is the out the outdoor school that I uh, worked with previously and then again most recently, we were only able to do day programs because the school was impacted due to wildfire a couple of years ago. And uh, what I've seen uh, proposed, but not formally amongst uh, various school districts is uh, suspension of field trips altogether. And so it, it it, it, it's really uh, a, a, a challenge to see how these programs are gonna overcome uh, such concerns uh, and where, it's, where the priority isn't necessarily as high as just physically uh, meeting basic needs uh, come this fall. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Karina? Sorry, my hand was just up from before, but another thing I've heard from, <clears throat> excuse me, our county schools is um, 
not only no field trips, but at this point, probably no visitors to campus, which also bars us coming and being guest naturalists. So we're looking at total virtual curriculum in the fall until either of those things are possible. Mm -hmm. Joanna, did you want to say something? Uh, you're still muted, Joanna. Sorry, I'm that one person that is muted. <laughs> so I want to say that that's what we're, I'm in Orange County, and we're hearing the same thing here, Corina, about not being able to offer any field trips whatsoever, and uh, the idea of bringing in visitors to the schools if they reopen in some kind of hybrid system online and in-person combination. That's really, like, they're still, they're still debating the possibility of having any children on campus physically. Uh, which I know is not the case in every district. Other districts are already kind of moving forward with the plan to reopen at least for a few days a week. So uh, first, let me just tell you that I'm very, I think I'm different from most of you professionally because I used to be a, a curriculum developer, uh, informal education professional, and now I'm a PhD student. So I have not been impacted professionally right now because of COVID-19. But I work with nonprofits. I still work as a volunteer. Um, and they're going through this process of figuring out how to adjust the finances, right? That, you know, and, and lots of my friends have been laid off because of COVID-19. One of the organizations that I work for applied for PPP, the um, Pro Paycheck Protection Plan. It was complicated, but not that complicated. So if you're still working and you have the means to pitch that to whomever your supervisor, if you are a supervisor, maybe look into that. I know they're running out of money, but they're still giving those PPPs and it's something to at least buy some time to figure out what to do next. So we've been working really hard to keep our staff paid through, you know, at least to give them time to prepare for whatever next step will be, which might end up being layoffs just so you, you know like to be very clear so here's what we're doing in the two groups that I'm, I'm part of the board of directors of two nonprofits here so one of them we're just hanging in tight because most of our income comes from grants and from contracts so we're not going to lose a lot of money from the income that used to come from the the visitor the field trips the money from paid field trips uh, the other one we're going online and we're doing the Zoom meetings that somebody mentioned in which the expert comes online and talks to groups of kids. I'm the expert, I'm a plankton person. So I actually uh, brought my microscope home. You can see this is my bedroom, that's my microscope. I hook that thing up to my camera <laughs> and I, sh I, go online, I go to the beach and I collect plankton and the kids love it. And I'm serving any kind of parent who's bored at home. If they can put a group of five kids I do it for free, and then I ask them to donate money to the nonprofit. Okay. If you Thank can find you. scientists that would be willing to help you, bird experts, invertebrate experts, anyone who will talk to kids for 15 minutes and then ask the parents to donate money to the nonprofit, it's one idea. That's great. I know a number of uh, programs are, are working on the online, the virtual uh, um, curriculum. My question is, if you have all these laid off people, who creates this virtual curriculum? And do they do it out of the goodness of their own heart? Or are they getting paid to do this? I know where we work right now, we have three weeks left. We're, we will be paid for three more weeks and then we're done. And so we're scrambling to create as much as we can to have available so that we can slowly filter this stuff out throughout the year so that they can have it have it and then we're also creating a five-day program where a, a group ordinarily would come to our campus on you know that particular week here's a five-day program here's you know science things we've recorded campfire programs we've recorded virtual field trips and then we have like a, a, how to make journals and, and journal entries and things like that. So that's kind of our focus right now. Um, well, let's see who I'm looking at these little blue hands that are up here. Ashley, I haven't heard from you. Want to you want to chime in? 
And then we'll get Andrew and Karina. I'm just looking at the blue hand, so it seemed to work pretty well. And if you're trying to figure out how to do the blue hand, you go down to the participants. And under participants, you, hit, you can click on your little blue hand there. So where's Ashley? Go ahead. So my name is Ashley. I'm out in Georgia. I'm in a nature center called Oxbow Meadows, and we're run out of a university, Columbus State University. So luckily, we are able to retain our full-time staff. And by that, it's like three or four of us. There's not very many. But we are losing a lot of our staff. Um, luckily, that happened naturally. They were phasing out anyhow, going to other positions, going on to grad school and whatnot. Luckily, we have animals at our site. So we actually have a collection. And with managing that collection, one of our animal care um, employees will soon be moving on to grad school in New York. And um, so my position, I'm the main educator there. I'll be taking on a lot of that animal care and doing a lot less teaching, but we will be doing virtual programming. But I just wanted to chime in to let y'all out in California know that we also are hearing that there will be no visitors on site to schools and they have already made decisions, at least out in the county that I'm in, that there will be no field trips for sure. So we have already been told that go ahead and focus on that virtual programming with as much interaction as you can, because we're also dealing with Wi-Fi and all of that and trying to still bring our programs outside with still dealing with Wi-Fi and being able to broadcast and things like that. I just wanted to share my Georgia view. Thank you. Nice to have somebody from the East Coast there. Yeah, it's great. It's interesting how many people we have from all over the place. Andrew. Sure. I just wanted to offer a kind of a bigger picture perspective. It's always hard to, to keep this in mind, but you know, so as environmental educators, we always try to talk about kind of the scale of time, geologic time, evolutionary time, and stuff like that, is that one way to look at this is that environmental education is going to have to change because of this circumstance. And so it's trying to find that balance between how can we keep our programs in operation and get kids' experiences right now, and right now it could be the next six months to 18 months or 24 months, and what is environmental education going to look like in 2025? Uh, because it will, it will have to look different. Um, and so that's, uh, but like, like an evolutionary perspective, you know, extinctions are hard. <laughs> like, you know, like it, it's, 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 a, it's a horrible thing to say. I don't mean that obviously literally that I want people to go out of business or people to die. But the idea that it's, it's going to have to take us being thoughtful and intentional about if we still believe in the premises of environmental education, of getting kids outside, getting kids engaged with nature, we're going to have to look at it differently and not not assume it's going to look like it did six months ago. Um, and I don't just mean after we get a, a, a vaccine. I mean that because of this, there will be social, educational, structural changes that schools and families will expect us to be doing differently. And so we should be thinking ahead of what, if we still believe in the premise of good quality environmental education, and we still think it's important they go to places away from their school, if, we, if you believe that, we have to already be thinking about what that's going to look like and be adaptive and um, flexible going forward because if our goal is to make it, is to have it come back to exactly what it was before, that's not necessarily a recipe for success. Yeah, and, and, and I really, I really appreciate it. And that was kind of, that's kind of, I'm glad you brought that back around to, because that, that's, what are the adjustments that we make after these pandemics and epidemics? And we're obviously going to have to do that. And I think that document for when I was reading the ACA, the American Camp Association document, they, they have a lot of really good suggestions in there. And some of those things are things that you're going to have to do permanently. It'll, there'll be permanent changes within, within our, our campuses. Okay. Okay, well, I really appreciate you guys being here. We have a few more minutes if you guys want to hang on and, and keep talking. If anybody else has anything else they'd like to uh, contribute, um, just chime in right now. And uh, you, don't even, you don't have to wait for me to call on you. Okay, I'm re reading some of the comments in the chat. I, I would like to share that we are putting together a summer institute for teachers. So we're hoping to serve about 20 and 30 middle school and high school teachers and help them convert teachers who teach environmental science, biology, specifically the teachers that we normally would serve with our field trips, just to be clear. And we're going to help them adjust their lesson plans to this 
hopefully temporary circumstances that they are also facing. So we're hoping to continue serving the teachers and the students and the families in a different way. And the Summer Institute is meant to help them do that, like just finding resources. We're talking to teachers and teachers are so depressed right now. And they're just, you know, super anxious about what to do next fall without knowing if the kids are gonna be back in the classroom or not. So the idea is that this summer to have uh, 10 days with these teachers and help them develop their lesson plans. And one of the things we're gonna be helping them is to teach their students and their families to go outdoors, especially here where we live, it's very cultural. Um, I'm just gonna say really openly, white people will go outdoors and recreate outdoors and uh, color, people of color usually don't do that because they're scared, because they're um, unable. So we're gonna try to fold in some equity and inclusion and teach people how to safely go outdoors with their families and uh, what to do when they're out there. So we're creating worksheets and identification cards and things like that. So if anyone wants to know more about that, just email me, I'll put my email here and um, I would love to collaborate further. I'm a volunteer, so I don't work on that anymore, uh, but my heart is pretty much still in it, so. That's really great. I'm really glad you, you brought that up because there's a lot of times when we're, we're coming up with some of these uh, virtual virtual lessons or whatever and we ask them you know go outside and, and find four leaves or whatever four different kinds of leaves they might not have, a lot of, a lot of kids don't have that it's not, and that's not within their realm so being able to use stuff within their home or other things is something to keep in mind as well so um did you put your okay there's your email thank you uh, somebody uh catherine did you want to say something yeah. Um, since I, it seems like ever a lot of people have had chances to talk, I, I have a question and I, I kind of want to crowdsource. I'm an early career educator and I'm currently working on a grant funded position that's going to end uh, for uh, Mass Autobahn here on the East Coast. And I'm interested in being a naturalist at a residential outdoor school. However, given things that are different, is it something where I could there's even going to be a space for the entry level educator in the fall, or is it kind of like take a hiatus, go work and, you know, I don't know, do, doing something else and come back in a year, that kind of situation. Like, what would you guys recommend? I've been trying to do a lot with online education in terms of learning more about social media, video creation, online content, virtual lessons, but at the same time, there, I don't know, is there a spot for that in the fall or is it like that kind of thing? So I'm interested to hear your ideas. Well, right off the top of my head, I would say this fall looks pretty grim as far as being able to get employed as an environmental educator at a residential outdoor science school. I don't think anybody's going to be in operation. Um, if I was a if I were to put money down, if I were to bet, um, I would say maybe next fall, maybe next summer, people, sites might be starting to coming up with ideas. It depends on vaccines. Like I said in, that, in my presentation, it all depends on vaccines, treatments, or herd immunity. And if we can get to the point where there is our communities where there's no, there's no spreading of COVID-19, you know, they're, they're free of it and there's not there. And the community that they're going to is free of it. Then parents and administrators would feel okay sending them there. But until that happens, I just, I personally don't see it happening. Catherine, I'll, I'll chime in here too. Um, I'm from San Joaquin County and we only hire, um, we only have two permanent staff members and everybody else we hire are entry level um, intern naturalists. And even for us right now with that, we, we don't know. Um, our program may be paused for the full year just literally for us it's transportation because we have to go across two counties to get our kids there and if i can only put 10 kids on a bus I, it just we, right. we can't do it so um it's unfortunate that this might be a year of waiting on your dreams to think about that but keeping in contact with people keeping your, your name out there and all of that but um there, there won't be that many entry-level positions because um so many people who have experience are also going to be in that same job pool right now. Thank you. But in the meantime, 
you know, if, if you are interested in this career, take advantage of some of these online opportunities, you know, what, you know, the, what Joanna was talking about, or there's other, there's a number of, it's, that's one of the things I think another silver lining is that people have realized that there are ways to conduct learning and, and, and improvement virtually. And so prepare yourself and be ready for the, when things do open up and have a lot of these other um, skills underneath your belt. So when you come in, you're, you're a step ahead of everybody else. Anybody else? All right. Well, I really appreciate you guys coming and, and listening to me. And, uh, and, uh, and I like all the contributions everybody uh, uh, submitted as well. And then and this has been recorded. So um, I guess we'll be able to go back and listen to me or other people. And I also have what my presentation that I wrote, I wrote an actual document that goes with it and I gave it to AEOE and I think that's going to be put on the Google Drive. So if you want to get to that and in that document, there's lots of resources plus um, ideas on how to, uh, you know, open up and uh, things that you need to kind of keep in consideration if you are going to be trying to uh, run an outdoor education program. So thank you all for showing up and thank you, Andrew, for hosting. And uh, we'll see you all later. Bye. Thanks, Dean. So go ahead and uh, stop the recording if you haven't already. Okay. It's